Hey, good evening, and welcome to this week's edition of the Ride Along Radio Show, the show where you get uh, the experience of riding in a virtual police car with police veterans as we uh, patrol the mean streets of Los Angeles. Get ready, because you're going to get uh, a lot of information tonight, uh, the truth as we see it at least, and it's going to be unfettered, unvarnished, unfiltered, unadulterated, and I'm running out of adjectives to say that things have not been diluted. <laughs> so you're going to get, here comes a butt naked truth riding across the internet on a horse named Credibility. Yeah, buddy. And here we go. I'm George Holt. I'm Gil Contreras. And to my left, you will see our, our former and again guest, Marshall McLean, who is the president of the Los Angeles Airport Peace Officers Association, which is a police uh, labor union that represents uh, police officers at LAX Airport. Yes, sir. Ontario Airport. Yes, sir. And Van Nuys Airport. That is correct. And, and also firefighters at Ontario. And firefighters at Ontario. And firefighters at Ontario. So that's uh, that's quite a mouthful and quite a lot of people to uh, to represent. But, um, you know, you guys are doing a fine job over there. I may be a little bit biased, but uh, I think you guys are doing a fine job over there at the uh, LAX well, well, Airport. We police. do have some questions, though, about what happened the other day. But. Oh, definitely. That's yeah. yeah. That's on the agenda. Questions about Zorro? Zorro. I heard he escaped. I heard the suspect escaped in a white Mustang. On a white Mustang. Oh, it was. On, it was. Oh, it was on a white Mustang, not in a white Mustang. Oh, okay. okay, I get it. <laughs> or was it silver? Okay, I don't know. All right. So, um, but we're actually let's 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 start off so we don't move past that at all and not do what we're supposed to do. Um, we had a guest here a few months ago, uh, Mr. Joe Hicks. And uh, Joe Hicks was a uh, conservative commentator who wasn't always conservative. Right. Who uh, actually was uh, kind of a firebrand, uh, firebrand, uh, um, I don't want to call him a socialist, but a firebrand activist kind of a guy, militant kind well, of a I guy. Well, I started with the Black Panthers. So. Right, so that's pretty firebrand yeah. uh, activist. <laughs> you more uh, firebrand than that. Right. And um, over the years, uh, kind of came to change his views. And uh, Gil, uh, he was Gil's contact, and so I'll, I'll let Gil kind of uh, give us a little rundown on Mr. Uh, Hicks history, and the, and the reason we're talking about him today, I guess yeah. I should have led with this, is that we lost him recently. Right. Uh, yeah, he, he, he did away. pass away uh, last Sunday at a hospital in Santa Monica. Apparently, uh, complications uh, due to a, uh, a post-surgical uh, complications after a hernia operation. Uh, he was 75. Hmm. And, okay. uh, you know, um, I, he, I knew him as the former Human Relations Commission Director for the city of Los Angeles. Right. Uh, that's how I knew him. I'd seen him at KPFK when I was doing public radio over there. And I, you know, I just kind of followed him, you know, it's, you know, he's one of the very few uh, black conservatives, you know, that that you'll find anywhere. Him and uh, Larry Elder. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, so, so Joe, but, you know, we were, when we invited him to be on this show to talk about the Black Lives Matter movement and some of the stuff, stories that we were covering, uh, you know, when he, when we, when I finally did get to meet him, sit down with him and we had 90 minutes, almost two hours with him. Right. Uh, you know, he's probably, you know, one of the smartest people that I've ever had the opportunity to interview. And, and I've interviewed everybody from the mother of one of the North Hollywood shootout suspects to Al Gore when he was running for president. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. And everybody and in between, right? Everybody in between that, that's who I've interviewed, you know, as, as a journalist. And uh, of course I'm an award-winning journalist in addition to being a former policeman. All uh, right. So, uh, so, I, you know, and, uh, I had sent, uh, I had sent Joe an email, um, Shortly before I heard about his death, uh, inviting him to come back because I, uh, you know, I wanted to get back, uh, get back into the discussion that we started with him. And sure. I really hope to, you know, I, I wanted for this show, I wanted to uh, pull some clips from that. And I just didn't get a chance to do it. it was, my, my life is real busy. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Which I, is good, yeah. you know, because it's I'm, a good I'm, thing. Sure. I, I have my own little business and we do canines and EP and other stuff. So, uh, so but, busy is good. Yeah. Busy is good. But, um, you know, at some point I'm going to do that and maybe I'll do a little tribute and we'll post it on our website or something. Yeah. Because I think Joe, you know, is such a loss, you know, his voice and his ideas and and really the transformation. Because, you know, after I left law enforcement, I was very disenchanted with uh, with law enforcement. I was disenchanted with the war on drugs and gangs. I I thought what we were doing out there was just futile. I just saw no no end to it. I came I came to agree with that point of view at a certain point. So when when I left law enforcement, I I kind of went off, you know, politically left and and kind of that was before you left law enforcement. Let me tell you, I remember I remember compared to the rest of us at that time. Yeah, you were you were pretty liberal. 
And, uh, you know, so his transformation, it kind of reminds me of mine because he, he said that the, the beginning of his transformation to be, being a uh, conservative voice was uh, after September 11th. Oh. And, and that's kind of what happened with me, uh, you know. After September 11th, you know, I began to question some of these, you know, namby pamby positions that I was that I was holding on to, because I had been, you know, if you know anything about KPFK, you know, 90.7 FM in Los Angeles yeah. is public radio station, but it's listener sponsored public radio. It's not right. NPR. And so, you know, they were known in Los Angeles, they were known as communist radio, <laughs> you know, because, because they're so far to the left, they're at the end of the dial. At the end of the dial, right, right. For God's sakes. That's funny. Uh, but, um, you know, so a lot of, I heard a lot of that in, in uh, my news director at the time, who was Frank Stoltz, who's uh, yeah, who's now, also a former guest. Yeah. Also a guest here. He's a, mm-hmm. um, he's a reporter for KPCC now at uh, 89.3 FM in Los Angeles. And he's a great guy. You know, Frank's a very smart guy. We've had David Cruz on. Yes. Uh, you know, David's one of the smartest All guys solid and, journalists. And, and mentors that I know. And and Joe, I hold Joe in that group, you know, of really sure. smart people that, that I'm fortunate enough to, to know and be able to reach out to and talk to. So um, I was sad. I, I was saddened by, by, you know, learning of Joe's death. And, uh, you know, I want to do a little bit more on him. And maybe we'll just post it on our website because uh, he, okay. he, was, he was a great guest, a uh, smart guy with some really um, – informed opinions about things and you know what i got from him was that when i asked him i asked him about the transition the, the you know if you want to call it a, an evolution or a prior or the progression or whatever how he went from left to right and i felt like i got a legitimate answer i, I didn't feel like i was sitting next to a sellout which right. is what happens often you know what i mean right. when somebody kind of uh maybe gets uh start having little needs and monetary needs and they find this plays better and this pays better and they kind of started adapting those positions because they got to eat. Right. And I didn't get that from him at all. Yeah. I, no, I mean, he could point to, you know, the, the thing that made him radical, uh, that radicalized him was during the Watts riots. You know, he said yes. that, he, the story was he was sitting on his front porch, you know, having a beverage. He wouldn't say what, of what kind, but he was right. having a beverage. <laughs> right. And, uh, and here comes the National Guard with, you know, Jeep with a guy on a 50 cal. Right. Sure. You know, and and apparently he's on his porch, and the guy in the fifty cal swung around and pointed at him, and told him to get back in his house. Whoa! In America. In, in America, you know, in his on an his, American soldier on his own block, and, and the wow. guy drove off, and then ten minutes later came back, and 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 Joe said that that in that moment he wondered what in the world is happening. This sure. Is, this is this is government gone too far. Right. You know, when I'm at so my own house push back. on my own property on my own porch, and it doesn't right. matter what the hell I'm drinking. Uh, you know, you don't have a right to come tell me to go inside. Number one, number one, yeah, but number two, you don't point a fifty cal at me and think I'm <laughs> Jesus I, you know, Christ, I'm and that's gonna, okay. Yeah, so that was that was the beginning of his uh, you know radicalization, and and he kind of went into you know anti government and then kind of commie you know uh, philosophy. Well, that because that's that was the alternative back then. There was no uh, there was no radical Islam ideology present in this country. Really, right. it was out there, it, it was but it communist. was in Algeria, et cetera. So that's what right. you had. That's right. You had the communists out here, and he was from Los Angeles. So because before it, there was that's a, what you had here. Before there was a war on terror, there was a war on communism, and so uh, you know th- that that was it was the Cold War in. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Red right, Scare. Right, the, the Red Scare. Because I was going to say that. Yeah, the Red Scare. And that was, they were the enemy, the big, the Soviet bear, right? And, and all the other uh, offshoots of that. And back then, there was, there was, you know, a lot of people were advocating the overthrow of, of the U.S. government. But they were always fringe groups, you know? Rod's going to say that, yeah. It, it was, you know, it was the Students for a Democratic Society, or it was the Black Panthers, right. to a lesser degree, uh, the Brown Berets in East L.A., uh, but, but they didn't, they didn't have the outreach that they have now with social media, so it, right. it, it didn't really get a lot of traction. Well, they didn't have the outreach, but they didn't have so many followers today. That's why today everything that used to be fringe when I was a kid is now has now been made made mainstream, and so what we have in America, and and we're creating this new America where the tail is now wagging the dog. And uh, well, I think the, I think no, the tail no, is the dog now. No, November November is going to be a pivotal moment. It is for for this country. It is, and, and uh, wow, yeah, I'll be glad when November eighth comes because then we'll know what happened. But you know, the fallout begins at that right. point, one way or another. And I do want to say one other thing before I go because I told my son I would do this. Apparently, my son was in the studio today. Yeah, so I hear. <laughs> my I got Chris, I got a phone uh, call today saying uh, that he was here. Shout out to you, Chris, and uh, we got to get together soon. 
uh, so we can uh, do some lunch and get caught up. But, you know, he Chris has been on the fringe uh, of the music business for years. OK. You know, when I was a when I was a policeman and he was a young kid, you know, he he had posters of Run DMC on his wall. Nice. That, that nice. Was, that was his era. <laughs> So um, good, but uh, yeah. So he's a you know he's a videographer and he's, he's oh so that's why he was here today. He was work, working yeah, on a project. He was working on a project. And good. So he was in studio today, and I got a text. You know, I missed this call, but I got a text saying, "Hey, I just met the poet. Apparently, he's a fan of hers." Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. He remembers her from uh, from the beat. So oh, cool. You know, he called her a legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she is <laughs> our yeah. our producer. So uh, yeah. anyway, I just wanted to say, uh, hey, Chris, uh, you know, keep up the good work, and um, you know, we'll get together soon for some lunch or something. Very nice. Very nice. If you want to add your voice to this conversation, you can reach us at 323-293-3375. Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover today. Man, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff, but we're going to start off with something that's fairly local, but it made national news. And that was our security scare at LAX the other day. And um, some of you may have heard about that and uh, some of the reactions that came out of that. And, and fortunately, we've got a resident expert on aviation law enforcement and aviation security sitting right here. So we're going to roll this video, and then uh, we're going to have our panel discussion on it and uh, hear what the expert has to say. Breaking news overnight. Scenes of panic at Los Angeles International Airport after false reports of an active shooter sent passengers scrambling, sprinting for shelter, even out onto the tarmac. It is raising big questions again about airport security. And ABC's Kena Whitworth is on the scene at LAX. Good morning, Kena. Yeah, George, good morning. It was definitely scary. And like you said, it was a false alarm. Reports of an active shooter here at Los Angeles International Airport causing widespread panic and flight delays. You can see people behind me. They're just now getting rebooked after spending the night in the airport. Shooting in progress, LAX. Overnight, pandemonium in one of the world's busiest airports. And a number of shots, people running all directions. Reports of an active shooter causing chaos at LAX just before 9 p.m. Sunday evening. A wall of people all running at a full pace. Hundreds of passengers evacuating from at least four terminals, running for safety through emergency exits and onto the tarmac. <laughs> Many more stampeding to baggage claim. All of a sudden there was a flood of people saying there's a shooter. I mean, everyone is in a huge panic. Planes grounded while authorities searched the airport. They came sprinting back, screaming, get down on the ground, stay on the ground. Everyone was very scared. Trying to identify a possible shooter. Police with guns drawn, passengers dropping to the ground. The Detaining this man in a Zorro costume. LA ABC station KABC interviewing the man after he was released. He was so shaken he didn't want to show his face on camera. I get the police all around me tell me, put your hands up, put your hands up. I'm not even thinking about what I was wearing. And then it searched me and found out that I had no weapons or anything on me. But this morning, police say it was all a false alarm. No evidence of a shooting or anyone down. Reports of an active shooter proven to be nothing more than loud noises. This just weeks following a similar evacuation at JFK. That scare provoked by loud noises from Olympic celebrations. Hundreds of people were able to push through doors and get onto the tarmac right next to planes. That's a normally restricted area and a security risk. And this morning, they're investigating to find out where those noises came from. Wow. Amy. What a frightening evening, Kana. Thank you so much. So, uh, we got that video that shows the uh, overview of what happened the other day. This was, what, three nights ago? I think something like that. Sunday. Sunday, okay, and this is Thursday, so four, four right. or five nights ago. Right. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, I want to touch on, because it came right at the end of the video when they said this, where they talked about how uh, people running out onto the tarmac uh, created a, uh, a security issue, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's not something we would like to see happen. But I don't think it's the threat to security that people think it is because people are thinking, well, somebody could get something on the aircraft, so on and so forth. And, you know, I'll let the experts speak to it more, the current experts speak to it more. I used to be an expert in uh, aviation law enforcement security before I retired. So I'm a retired expert now. But I'm let the current experts speak to it. But, you know, there's three levels of security in the airport facility. Uh, you have your public area where anybody can be, right? When you pull up to uh, the curb and go to the ticket counter and downstairs at the Starbucks next to the baggage claim, that's all what's considered to be the public area, and you don't have to go through any screening to get there. Mm -hmm. 
Then you have out on the tarmac, um, under the airport, so to speak, where all the workers are, where they're moving your luggage around, they're refueling the plane, um, they're pulling the planes from place to place. That's called the secure area, okay? And uh, it's also called the side area because everybody has to have an ID badge out there. But where the passengers are is considered to be the sterile area. And that's where you have to go take your shoes off. You can't have a water bottle over 3.5 ounces, all that kind of stuff. So what you had was people go from a sterile area into a secure area, which is a lower level of security. So it's not like there was contamination that now the sterile area is going to have all these problems. I mean, again, that's not what we want to see, but well, go ahead. First off, that's not quite accurate. You would like to think so. And that's how it's supposed to work. That's but, how it's supposed to work. But unfortunately, when there's pandemonium and there's no one I like that word there's no one uh there manning the screening area or to manage the to manage the chaos or, or to have that line in the sand and stop people from going from the public area to the sterile or secure area then there is cross-contamination because that day you add people run through screening onto the airfield and vice versa are you kidding me wow right. that's not supposed to happen uh, by the way, so that's mine. Okay, sorry. You, you mean <laughs> you mean it's not supposed to have happened again? Hmm, it's not supposed to happen ever. Okay. Not supposed to happen ever. But uh, clearly, this is an ongoing thing. So now let me ask you this. So I've heard that TSA uh, people have, have put TSA at fault for this. Uh, people have said that there's an issue. With the, there was no uh, PA system um, operating in that terminal where they can safely and effectively communicate with a bunch of people. Like, what do you think? was the one or two pivotal things that could have made this better. Well, first, before, before we even get to that, yeah. what happened? Okay. Why did these people think shots were being fired? Okay, let me, let me take you through the chronolo chronology of how this all went down. Okay. From, from what I'm being told, there's, there's still ongoing um, after-action meetings, and I think ultimately there'll be an after-action report because of the amount of money that was lost. I believe it was over 240 uh, flights that were delayed. People don't think about that, that it has a ripple effect yeah. system-wide yeah, when yeah. there's a full ground stop at a ma major airport. Right, you're talking millions. <clears throat> when, when, I, uh, when I first got the alert on my phone, that was actually followed up by a phone call from a friend of mine who was in another state that couldn't come to LAX because wow. everything was delayed yeah, there. Yeah, full ground stop. Nothing comes in, nothing goes. Exactly. So um, from what... What they've been able to piece together, and, and I'll tell you what we can confirm and what we can't as of yet, and what I believe um, could have helped mitigate some of the problems and some of the problems that are still in place today that were problems when uh, George was a, a sergeant there. So you have, uh, you have a situation where uh, initial reports was a, was a man dressed in, in, in all black uh, waving a sword around. Which, obviously, Zorro. Well, Z Zorro started this. People of of our generation and older would know what Zorro, Zorro was, was, right? But most of the cops today and most people aren't thinking. Okay, a man in black with a sword. They're not thinking Zorro. They're just oh right, sure. They're a ninja. Walking, they think it's a ninja. They're or something. thinking Walking Dead. Yes, there there were reports of ninjas or, or ninja. <laughs> I should say. Wow. So the officers respond. See, see this individual, a, as described, dressed all in black with a mask and everything and the hat uh, and, and had a sword. So um, the video's already out there. Uh, they wound up taking him down, um, taking him into custody, didn't arrest him, just, you know, figured out what. Right, figure out what his story was. Now, from that incident right there, that that uh, apparently bothered some people. They saw it. They heard cops using you know, command presence and using their loud voice, mm -hmm. pointing their guns at people and giving them directions. That startled some people. From there, either there was a TSA person in the midst of that or they were later notified by some individuals there saying that there was some type of security incident going on um, with the police. Guns may have been mentioned uh -huh. around 700. From that point, now keep in mind, this is it, it, it could have been a felony stop, it could have been anything, high risk stop, it, it could have been a pet stop, whatever. Right. That has nothing to do with TSA or the security process. That's okay? true. Nothing at all. Sure. But yet TSA, from what I'm told, took it upon themselves to then notify every terminal that 
that some security incident was going on at 700. Did now, they did they check with anybody in the airport police first? I'll get to that. Okay. So the problem first I think off, it sounds like a no. Well, <laughs> the problem is and you already know that answer, but the problem is there's no vetting process. TSA is, is, is doing some of their own things on their own. Right, because they probably feel they don't have to answer to the local authorities because they're but federal. What da, happened da, da, to da. the shots fired? I, I thought He's getting there, too, oh. after he gets somebody no. On the so, t- <laughs> so from that, some of the security screening stations at some of the terminals took that to mean we need to get out and started directing people out. They start dumping the terminals? Okay. So as some, you, you remember the big ACAMS doors? Yes. Okay. So from now, that, some of the explain, people. Can explain to people what ACAMS a, doors ACAMS are? ACAMS doors are the security access doors that lead out to the, the area of the tarmac. Okay. They're, they're pretty heavy doors. So if, you, if, you're, if you're being told you need to get out, we have an incident, we need to get out, people are leaving. So say you're down the hallway. Now you have people behind you going out first door they see which is right. out to the tarmac. Which has panic hardware on it just for you to be able to do that and get out, exactly. by the way. Mm-hmm. Those panic doors, they're going out. Now those doors are slamming behind you. And bam. people are hearing the bam. bam, 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 bam. Now they're relating. That's the incident. I'm hearing loud bangs. It's shots fired. They took that, two and two and made six out of it. Wow. That gets translate translated to other terminals by TSA. Because I kept wondering, how is an incident at 7 with Zorro affecting people at Terminal 4, right. Terminal 5, Terminal 7? That, that just doesn't right. make sense. TSA took the ball and ran with it and in the wrong direction. Not, scored, not, a, not, scored a touchdown for the other team. Not, not, only, uh, not only are there hypersensitive passengers, but there's hypersensitive employees who were working on November 1st mm-hmm. who, sure. who are sensitive to that. Now, the, the, from now tell, I, tell the people what happened on November 1st. Uh, November 1st, which... 2013. To 2013, yes. you, you, you had the Virgin America Terminal 3 where, I won't even say his name, but the a suspect came in and shot and killed a TSA agent and, along with uh, ultimately, I believe, seven people were injured. Right. Uh, a total of four were shot. Two, two were TSA. And the third one was killed. And another, I believe, was a, a school teacher. Um, and it just came out today that he actually has taken a, a, a plea deal. He's going to plead guilty, and they're going to take death penalty off off the table. That came out earlier today. Uh, the timing yeah. is just amazing. Bizarre. Yeah. Um, but but the thing that I, I want to mention here is is from what I'm told from individuals who were there, the officers who were in and around the terminals, those terminals didn't get dumped. Because, right, because they because were there they to, were able to figure out what's going on. Say, right. Hey, there, there, there's there's nothing going on. What, what's going on? Right. So this goes back to what we've been trying to push ever since 2012. So the Undersecretary of Transportation after 9-11 mandated that every screening station would have an armed LEO or armed law enforcement officer there, period. That got laxed as time went on. People started getting complacent. Ah, we really haven't had an incident. Right. Right. Okay. So it allowed the TSA administrator to go ahead and, and allow you know some flexibility on that. Now keep in mind with everything else, when there's ever there is a mandate, there's money associated with it. All right, of course. So follow the money. TSA started thinking about it. Wait a minute, we, we need we need more money to do some more of these things, like call ourselves officers now, like get a, get badges. Get metal badges. Get metal badges, right. get 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 new uniforms come up with these other things like BDO, Behavioral Detection Officer, and BAO, Behavioral or uh, Bomb Appraisal Officer, and all these other things wow. that they're created uh, uh, since 9-11 mm. and, and really try to push their way in, into law enforcement. Now, what, what really ticks me off about what happened Sunday and what happened on November 1st, our guys perform, perform fabulously. I saw those diamond formations as they were going okay. through the terminal. They showed it all over the news. They look very, very nice, very, very well trained officers. I mean, he, he helped train some of them. So that's why I'm so, saying. So, that. so, <laughs> it's, it's, it's right so we need to get back to some of that shield training, which has fallen by the wayside, unfortunately. But wow. So j- just follow me here for a second. So what happened is you had TSA took it upon themselves as an organization that said. We're no, go- we're no longer going to mandate airports having armed officers at the screening stations. Right, because that was expensive. Okay, so by them removing that mandate, they no longer have to pay for it or reimburse those local agencies. Right. So back in uh, 
two, around 2012, uh, myself, President Paul Nunziato, Port Authority of uh, New York, New Jersey, they got about 1,500 cops there. Um, they had 43 officers killed in 9-11. Yeah. Most people think it was just NYPD, but it wasn't. Um, you know, they have, they have the, the bad stigma of, of losing the most officers in one day than any other department. Yeah, I guess. Um, and then you also had DFW Airport Police. So the three of us, West Coast, East Coast, Middle America, all went to Washington together. We formed this, this uh, the co-founders, this alliance of airport, um, airport police officers. And the whole idea was Category X airports. Those are the largest, busiest trafficked airports, but the, also the, the airports that are, less, that are most likely to have any type of terrorist threat as well. And we said, look, we're, we're trying to get some kind of commonality here, get some common sense approaches to specifically deal with airports. So you say, hey, this is what the level of security is going to be. These are some of the things we're, we're, we're looking at across the board that are lacking. Camera coverage, which is still not adequate. That would have helped with this situation, too. Ca cameras behind screening to where, like on November 1st with the shooting, our guys were going in blind. It, active shooter, and all they could do is go by the report of the gunfire, mm -hmm. but nobody can actually on know camera where he say was. where yeah. the, the shooting itself isn't even on video. Wow. So, I mean, how is it that you have a hotel in Vegas that has better camera coverage yep. than LAX airport. You know, if you ever watch Homeland, I, right, I'm into Homeland right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, you, you know, you see all, you see all these uh, the, these videos, and you, it makes it look like the government is just so... Watching you everywhere. Man, it, everything is so... so it, it happens just like that, and the screens pop up, and there's cameras everywhere. Everybody knows exactly what to do, and yep. you find out it, it's not even close to me in the truth. Exactly. Wow. J JFK had a similar scare about two weeks ago, and and that's why we were, we were talking to each other saying, this is kind of bizarre... Uh, you know, in law enforcement, I, I've heard of, uh, and I'm sure you have heard of, of, of actual things that someone would call a coincidence, but you never actually seen one. Right. So when we started adding up, you go, wait a minute. So JFK had a same type of incident. Right. It also happened on Sunday. Mm -hmm. It also happened in the, the eight eight o'clock hour. It also happened at Terminal 8. Wow. wow. It also stemmed from a loud noise that someone mistaken yeah. for shots fired and right. the terminals were evacuated. And it had the same effect where 911 calls were coming from vo multiple terminals. Right. Now, back to the 911 system for a second here. So I can name, well, I can't name right now, but I have a list of, of 10 police agencies in L.A. County that have less than 50 officers. And they have a 911 system. They're, they're a PSAP, a public safety answering point where the 911 system, the call goes to them. If it's in their city. Okay. So if I'm in the airport right now and I pick up a public phone, because that's the only place you're going to find it, a public phone really is in the airports now, right? I pick up a public phone, I call 911, where does that call go? It goes to the Los Angeles Police Department. Downtown L.A. And they don't have any visibility about what's going on in the And airport. if I call uh, 911 on my cell phone, because the majority of the calls are going to come from cell phones, right? CHP. Yeah. Wow. Some, some of them were bounced to LAPD, depending on where. But it none is. of them went to the airport police. The agency that's right there is going to respond with a bunch of officers. What's that little? Uh, and I, I don't mean it as insulting, but what's that little department over there by Long Beach? I mean, you blink, you you drive through it. Long Beach. You have Long Beach, and then what is it? Signal Hill. Seal Beach. Seal Beach. Signal Hill. Yeah. Signal Hill. Signal Hill has their own 911 system. Incredible. Okay, but LAX does with not. 80 million passengers doesn't have its own 911 system. That video that was shown earlier and you heard the dispatcher, that was LAPD talking about what's going on at LAX. In downtown LA. Amazing. Listen, we're going to uh, cut to a break. We're going to come back and get on this. But before we go to a break, um, we lost uh, an airport police officer to cancer a few days ago. He's a guy I worked with for a long time, very well-respected guy, Officer Kaj Scott. And uh, there is a... Uh, Fundraising uh, uh, page. It's a, it's a charitable fund. Charitable uh, fund, yeah. Charitable account that was opened up uh, through the LA Police Federal Credit Union. And you can find that at uh, lapoa.com, L A A P O A.com. Correct. And you'll see the webpage for Kaj Scott. But just say a, a really good guy, longtime officer, very well respected, trained a lot of officers, including myself, when I first came to the airport. And his, uh, it's a serious loss. And then right on the heels of that, we lost a retired sergeant two weeks before that, Dwayne Myers, who's a really good guy. And we well, just, uh, well, we, we, we need to talk about that on another show of, of the uh, all these cancer. airport police officers dying of cancer because it's been happening and I've lost way too many friends to that. So let's, let's, let's table wow. that for another day. They're, they're, That's another yeah, thing. Jet a fuel. Yeah, it is. All right. So listen, we're going to go to break. Uh, we'll be uh, right back on the Ride Long Radio Show.
All right, hey, welcome back to the Ride Along Radio Show. Um, I am George Holt. I'm Gil Contreras. To my left is Marshall McLean, president of the Los Angeles Airport Police Officers Association. And we were talking about the lack of a modernized, or of any actually, 911 system at Los Angeles Airport and how a crime could be happening right in front of you at LAX Airport. And if you were to call, it would not go to the airport police like it should because the airport police, police what is it, 25 square mile patrol area in Westchester? Well, yeah, you, most people don't realize that we actually have residential property. Uh, the airport owns a lot of, of the footprint, not just the airport, but up and down Century Boulevard, uh, the, the park. They own part of the Westchester Park there that, yep. that's leased back to yep. the city. A lot of the, the, the footprint that the hotels actually s reside on, Denny's, airport owns that property. Yeah, well, you know, we live out in PDR, and I see those guys everywhere. <laughs> right. You know, we, we were driving uh, over the weekend, and uh, Patricia goes, she goes, hey, uh, what's the airport police doing way out here? <laughs> I don't know. Well, yes. you know, we're, it's the world airport police. Well, so. It was world <laughs> airport police, right. Wherever so, a plane travels, that's our yeah, We can go, right, <laughs> or, or passes over. But, Marshall, here, here's the thing, because I think uh, what, what, uh, what people would say is, well, if you have LAPD, and I know I understand LAPD has officers assigned to the airport, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how many, but you, you can tell me that. But if you have LAPD and they have officers assigned to the airport, uh, and if you call 911 and those calls go to them, uh, I, I don't quite understand the, um, like, how do you talk to each other? <laughs> how, how, how does LAPD <laughs> talk to LAXPD and, and CHP if they're routing cell calls to LAP? How does all that work? And, and and isn't really that what the answer will be from, if you ask anybody from the city, they'll say, well, airport police doesn't really need a 911 because if you call 911, you get LAPD, and they're already there. Isn't that really the argument? That That is some of the argument, but the reality is is the, the substation that's there, um, they don't get the calls directly either. They still have to be dispatched. It still has to be be sent to them, and and even with that, that that would make sense somewhat. So are if, they Pacific Division officers, or is that they are? D but Pacific, it's a substation. Yeah, it's a substation. Pacific Division is about three miles away. Right. Um, you, you go south to the harbor. The the harbor uh, does not have a a, a substation there. Uh, we have school police that patrol throughout the city of L.A. throughout the county. Right. They don't have a substation. Uh, our department is larger than school police and port police combined, but yet we still have this quote unquote partnership with LAPD. And, and it's, it's not to uh, besmirch LAPD at all, but I live in the city of LA. Um, I pay my taxes like anyone else does. Um, if something happens at my house, I can't call airport police to come out there. I'm, I'm calling for LAPD to come there. Mm -hmm. So so I'm expecting that when the mayor says that they're going to add more police officers to the street, they're to the street, not at the airport. Right. right. So, so some quick numbers here. L LAXPD, if you don't count the sheriff's department, LAXPD is the third largest police department in, in, in uh, L.A. County. Now, technically, LAX is not a police department. We're a division of a department, which is the Department of Airports. Uh, if you, you add in the L.A. County Sheriff's, we're the fourth largest. So you got L.A. County Sheriff's, LAPD, Long Beach, and then us. LAXPD is the 10th largest police agency in California if you exclude uh, state agencies such as CHP, state parks, and recs. Uh, if you include them, then we're the 12th. LAXPD is the 25th largest law enforcement agency in California. So most people don't realize the average police agency in, in California is about 50. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. We're if from the chief on down, I believe our current number is around 530. Uh, with the, the that's the, 10 times the average. Okay. With the bulk of that being at the airport. Um, so when I say you're, you're talking 80 million passengers coming through there, the call volume for service is off the charts, but you have people who will make these type of comments. Well, it's just the airport. And then I would argue, well, first off, we, d we put out more people on one deployment shift than most of the size of a police agency that surrounds right. us. Sure. Okay. So our calls are, are just typically Pacific Division because we're not a stat generating agency. We're still in the city of L.A. We can't use any, any uh, UCR. crime, crime right. reports. Mm -hmm. They don't come back to us. They come to LAPD. So typically Pacific Division's. Stats are off the chart because it's almost like they've got two divisions in one. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's where we book all our bodies. So, you know, I get into some of my other friends and, and other agencies. Ah, you're just airport police. And I'm like, we, we do more felony arrests in, in one day than you probably do in a month. Right, because the number of officers and the number of people we're dealing with. 
yeah. et cetera, et cetera, yeah. How, so, how many people do, does LAPD deploy on, on, a, on, a, on a given day? How many LAPD officers are, are uniformed? In, in, at LAX? Yeah, at LAX. And then how many LAX PD officers in uniform are out there? It, it's a very small number of, of LAP officers that are there. Um, typically, you won't even see them uh, unless you're working one of the, the special assignments or joint units like canines or, or detectives. Um, you know, our contention is pretty clear, and it has been for a long time, other than the bomb squad, there's not a function that LAPD provides that either we cannot do by statute or, or we're not it. already doing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so the sad part here is, out of, out of those numbers I gave you, the, the police chief's salary for, for airport police is 50th on a list in California, 50th. Even though the agency is the 12th largest agency in the, in the state. And that's done by design also because the CAO for the city of L.A. helps put his thumb on that and tries to liken it to, well, that's kind of like an LAPD captain, so we're going to keep that salary around there. <laughs> so that's why we wow. continue to have individuals like our previous chief, who was Chief Centennial. Okay? Chief Centennial was a lieutenant at Santa Monica, and he came from, Much being, smaller agency. from being a lieutenant. At a small agency. Spanish control of about 20 people to now being the chief of this large agency, and, and name another agency that you can think of, a police agency that has resources in more than one county. CHP? That's it. As far as patrol resources. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's about it. That's it, yeah. And so he went from a small, and Santa Monica is a bumping department, but it's a small department right. compared to LAX. Yeah, it's not and it, and it, and it's any of not, them. It's not, it doesn't span more than one county for yeah. sure. Yeah, and then when you talk about revenue, we're in the midst of a $10 billion expansion right now, but yet we literally have vehicles falling apart underneath us. We don't have a police station that, that's worthy of a police station. Sometimes we have officers changing in their cars out of lack of space. Is that trailer that priorities. I've seen on Imperial, is that your police station? That the trailer on Imperial, that would be a canine office. Oh, yeah. that's what the dog yeah. that is. Yeah. That was an office that was built for about five people, but I think you got about 45 yep. people in there. Wow. That's where I retired out of. That was my last assignment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, we, uh, again, I really do want to table this thing about this possible cancer cluster. And I'm not trying to raise any alarms, but we, we, need to, we need to look at that, man, and maybe get some People facts that are on that. People working there are, are already know. We've been talking about it for years, but now you're starting to see it, you know, back two, two deaths back to back like that of right. fairly young people. One guy was a little older, but he was in great shape his whole life, didn't smoke, didn't drink, no risk factors. Yep. And then uh, the other one was was fairly young, man, and it's just uh, uh, it's, it's 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 ridiculous. So, hey, we, getting back to the the shooting incident or the the, the scare, scare the scare right. the other day. So, so so TSA started doing their thing, mm -hmm. and then you guys restarted. You, well, you didn't receive calls. You just saw what was going on, and, we and got you had the, radio traffic. Right, we got we, no, we got the transfer calls of nine one one. It was a delay, but we're, we're, our dispatch got the calls from LAPD dispatch, and maybe even some transfers from CHP about a report of shots fired. That 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 message that you heard that was going out. So, and then in terms did LAPD of, officers respond from LAX, or, or but did Pacific Division both, also both. send? Oh, both. Both. Okay. So, so. When I said before, it's 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 really about a, a money, almost like a security company that someone uh, has owns. Uh, but you're basically using the 911 system to be able to dispatch resources to the airport. So you can charge them for so it. So you can charge for it because they're not dispatching those officers at the substation. And sometimes there's not even officers there at the substation. It's a very small amount. So they still have to send resources. So... Why would you be sending resources from a division that's already depleted down to the airport where they already have officers there? Because you can charge the airport. And not just charge the airport to recoup those officers' time and money, but at an increased rate, like a security company, to turn a profit. Mm -hmm. and, and that's Incredible. That's, that's really what it's about. So we got those calls. Now our officers had to do the cleanup job. First, making sure that there wasn't an active shooter. Once that was determined... Now we had to make sure that every terminal was clear. Then you had to bring all the canines in because you had people self-evacuated. So yep. you had all of these unattended bags. Right. They had to do quick and accurate searches with those dogs. Right, that, because those could, any of those could uh, right. contain an IED. So you had to make sure that it didn't because that could have been part of the whole diversion. Absolutely. 
and and like I said, in the back of your mind, you're going, well, this is kind of kind of weird. Is it's this, just happened in JFK. Is, is this real? Yeah. Uh, so then after that, they had to start the whole uh, repopulation pro- process, and and it's not just you're flipping a switch and everybody, okay, let's you know, right. you know, Ali Ali auction free, come on inside. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, you got to got to be rescreened. Yeah, so they, yeah, that's they, a big so, deal. So you got to get all the 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 supervisors in first. You got to get all the employees screened first. Got to get TSA up and running, and then they have to start that process as if it was day one. They just opened up and get all that going. So that that's what takes so long. So the things that were were done well is yeah, they did have that new system that in, that went in place that actually send a message out to cell phones within a five mile radius. Boy, yeah, our our cell phones <laughs> at the house, you yeah. know, we got uh, 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 yeah. Alert. That, that that did occur. There's still some things. I mean, both of you have traveled throughout the world, and you see some other airports that LAX still doesn't hold a candle right. to. Right, amazing. Little airports. Yeah, yeah. I mean, technology Little wise, airports. The, the fact that we don't have big LCD screens that, that are able to, to quickly turn into something and point, you know, exit this way, that type of thing. Right. The fact that you don't have a unified PA system. Right. Uh, KNX actually uh, did a joke today on uh, Ask the Mayor, and they, they actually purchased a bullhorn. And said, "Hey, you know, this might be cheaper. You can provide this to people to, to help with the communication." So, uh, he, but, but, yeah, he didn't think a lot of this was funny. I've listened to part of what he had to say yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. Be- because, but here's the thing: it's not a lack of money, not at it, all, because they have the money. It's 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 priority. So when you think that it's more important to spend upwards of a billion dollars on new lights, those big Y lights, right. before you do other infrastructure things because the mindset is we want to improve the passenger experience. Sure. But that includes keeping them alive. Correct. So I I try to explain to people this way. I'm not going to send my kids to school with dirty clothes and, and, and malnourished because that's a reflection on me and I wouldn't do that to my children anyway. Right. So if you want to be the world class airport that you're trying to be, why wouldn't you want? Because because George heard it, you know this might be the first police officer some people ever see coming. First in American America. police officer, we were told that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yet, <laughs> but yet you would you would allow them to be in a vehicle that's over ten years Raggedy. old, two hundred plus thousand miles where you could hear it squeaking coming around. I, I don't think people know this. Well, I, see, I, but people I, should I, know that. I, I think like they I don't mean, they don't realize it. Yeah, I mean, if when I see an airport police car driving, you know, because we live close, so. And we see them all the time, right? And, and you know, I, but I'm never close enough to like. Well, look at it next like, time. They, now you'll pay attention to some of the details, and now you know to look for that, well, right? I'll, I'll even show you pictures because what what they did, rather than spend money on buying new cars, they spent money on new decals to put on old cars, just so it would give the perception or appearance that it was a newer vehicle from across so the street. Nice. But isn't this the chief's job? Isn't the chief's job is to fight for the department? You talk to, about another subject. To, to you get, talk about a whole other show. That's a whole other show. That's a whole other ride along radio because, show. But let, let me say, let me go back to something you said about being the first American police officer that people see when they get off the plane. Impression. That was said over and over again. That people see American police officers in TV and movies and all that stuff. Adam people Cole. would want to take their, your picture. Sometime because oh, awesome. wow, there's an American police officer. Mm-hmm. That's like we see on TV. Listen, I did. I, I had a part in the LAX uh, PD recruitment video, and um, my line was: <laughs> In addition to catching bad guys, we also have to be diplomats, ambassadors, and travel guides. I didn't get to give a <laughs> thumbs up. I wanted to, so now I get to do it now. No, it was a head nod. It was a head wow. nod, right? Diplomats and amb- so diplomats, ambassadors, and travel guides. Because yes. We are often the first American police officer the person sees when they get off that plane from Tokyo or Munich or Moscow, wherever they came from. Gateway to the world. That's funny because when I was in Paris, I did the exact same thing. You know, I told my girl because she, she's from there. I said, hey, go tell these dudes that, you know, I was a cop in America. Yeah, you want to take a picture with them? Yeah. And, they, and these guys were like, yeah, come here. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and we, then, we. And, yeah. <laughs> Monsieur. <laughs> <laughs> you know? so, so, yeah, that's definitely. And I imagine the Bobbies in London get it too Absolutely. with the hats, right? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that, uh, God damn, that's, unfortunately, the sa- it keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening. And um, I'm really hoping we don't have a big body count one day because some of these things didn't get addressed. Well, well let, take the November 1st shooting. That, that individual had over 300 more rounds of ammunition. Um, both you, both of you are, are familiar with weapons. Um, that individual was not 
familiar with that weapon system. Right. Thank God. Had, had he been, thank God, there would have been a larger body count because even even the other individuals who were shot, they weren't sit or mass shots. They weren't head shots. Mm -hmm. uh, the the one teacher was shot in the leg. Um, and, and, and he was targeting TSA. He wasn't targeting everybody. Right. But if he had been targeting everybody, right. it would have been a problem. But, we got lucky that day. But, like, minus body, minus the one TSA count. officer. Yeah. You but, had but, a body but, count. But, yeah. And, and, and George and I have talked about this before, but think about this for a second. He, he, was, in, he was in Los Angeles for about 18 months. They, they believe that he may have done some kind of reconnaissance. But what we do know is when he came into LAX, when he got here, there were officers in and around the screening station because that was the process. Right. right. About six months prior to the shooting, our officers were, were pulled off of there. Because the mandate to, ended. Told to, told to roam around. So I don't know, and you could argue it either side. I don't know if having our officers in place would have prevented the, the TSA agent being killed. You could argue it would have deterred him from ever even coming in to begin with. Right. Uh, because... You can't take away from the fact that he did it after, not before. Mm -hmm. He did it after, right. and he wasn't. And he was here. And he, yeah, and he wasn't targeting police officers either. Right. Okay, but you could definitely say that if you had a trained officer, because you're talking about he's at an elevated position now, because he's coming from the downstairs up. Mm -hmm. And if you ever get to see the video, you'll see after he shoots the TSA agent. He's pausing because he's looking around because he's looking for the second TSA agent to shoot her too. She actually hides behind a pillar by the front door, and he doesn't see her. Wow. So then he starts back up the escalator, sees that he's still moving, comes back down, shoots him multiple more times, and then comes up. Plenty of time for an officer who was in the area would have been able to hear the report of that rifle and then engage him from high ground. Mm -hmm. Before he even got a chance to put the remaining rounds in that, in that down TSA agent. Definitely not being able to continue his path through the screening station to the rear of the terminal. Okay. Now, the part that irks me the most is after all this happened, what's the first thing they said? Where were the police officers? Why weren't they at screening? <laughs> right. Okay? After you pulled them off. TSA management, the very same people that did this, tried to put, turn around and say, where, where were the police officers? And then comes up with the only people who could protect TSA is TSA. We need to arm TSA. That right. was the idea. Mm -hmm. right. Not to say, hey, 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 we lift this mandate because we wanted to save money. Oh, they'll never do that. Right. Never let a crisis go to waste. So they get a chance to defer blame or deflect blame and get something they want. Right. So that's how they played it. So you have the GAO report that comes out and says TSA spent over a billion dollars on the behavioral detection program and don't really have anything amount to it. Mm. The running joke was you had three off-duty servicemen caught more terrorists than TSA did, and they spent a billion dollars. Oh, on the train? Wow. <laughs> the train in Paris. That was, that was a running <laughs> joke. You know, that, that's the thing about our government. It, it, just, it makes me crazy. It, it makes me want to stick needles in my eyes. <laughs> oh, you're, you're a dog guy, right? Yes. Have you heard about the, the suicide bomber dogs? Suicide bomber dogs. Yeah, not that the dogs blow themselves up, but they're there to detect suicide bombers. Oh, they, you tell me about the program they, where they, they actually they, bite. Some will say vapor weight. No, they don't bite. No, the, our do the, the our LAX dogs, dogs bite, our dogs not the are TSA able to dogs bite. To deploy uh, or, you know, lethal, take a lethal action. So you, you tell me this. Does this make any sense to have a civilian that's unarmed with a dog with the whole purpose? They don't bite. With the whole purpose, because they're mostly labs, <laughs> the whole purpose is to locate and find a potential suicide bomber with, right. with a, a body borne <laughs> bomb. And we asked, what was the protocol? You know what they said? Well, we'll let you know when we find one and we'll call you. Wow. So then that's when we developed a program that said no. Uh, so that they think Homie <laughs> the Clown's going to stand there. Right, and wait and without detonating yourself. Now your dog's hit. <laughs> they, they've right. they've, they already have these dogs deployed. Yeah, they put a lot of, they put a lot of money to that program. They're too, putting nationwide. more money, more dogs. They've even had dogs alert, and all they've done is taken the person and put them through secondary screening. Wow. Because that's all they could do. That's why. So, uh, so the the thing the airport police came up with was, uh, first of all, the the dog is going to bite you because the dog was able to not only detect the dis explosive it's a, odor. Yeah, it's a police patrol but, dog. You can deploy the dog. I was going to bite that ass if you try to run. Mm -hmm. And if you got stupid, there was a handler there with a gun who was going to shoot you in the face. Right. So, so it was a better approach we thought than uh, to have an unarmed civilian with a Labrador retriever yeah. dealing with the terrorist with a bomb.
but yet they're pushing more than that. And that's where, that's where do these come from? Where do that, these ideas that, come from? That but, same program that I told yeah, you about. Question. In conjunction with that, they took the FAMs, the air marshals, out of planes and put them on the ground. Yep. And came up with a sexy name called a Viper. Viper. I've Viper. heard of them. I've yeah, heard of okay. Viper teams. So, mm-hmm. so you tell me. I've not seen one. You tell me. Oh, I've but, seen I've, but I've heard I've them. Seen. We've yeah. seen them. They don't engage. But you tell me, can a federal officer enforce any state or local laws? Yeah. Nope. They have no jurisdiction. Okay. Nope. But yet the federal government is now spending more money to have more Viper details and take more federal air marshals off the planes and put them on the ground. So we have to wonder what that's really all about because it's clearly not about aviation security. And even though TSA has gone intermodal, meaning they now are not just with one mode of transportation being aviation, but with railways, they were buses, the, Super Bowl. the ships, et cetera. Oh, the, oh we, we deployed TSA resources to the Academy Awards mm-hmm. and uh, um, anything having to do with large crowds. Didn't you hear about the elections? That's ridiculous. They were at all the, uh, the government elections, over three, 3,300 different Amazing. events. Amazing. Listen. Screening people. So, what, <laughs> well, I, I've seen you know I've seen these cars, right? The white cars with the blue stripe. Yes, home Homeland night. Security. I've seen them in different places, you know, and some have light bars and some don't. Yeah. But I just wonder, you know, what's this guy doing way out here? What, what's he doing in a Charger, cruising through a city, through, through Gardena? You know, right. So what's what's, what's down here? You got a. Uh, what's well, he doing? He may not even really know. So listen, <clears> we're gonna we're gonna take our second break here. When we get back, we're actually gonna slide into our topic, our main topic which is Colin Kaepernick's police brutality protest. And You're just doing a, that because you don't like the Niners? Of, you don't like the 49ers? <laughs> I actually love the 49ers. Um, that, uh, that is a uh, uh, police-related topic, so we decided to talk about it. And it's a hot-button topic. A lot of conversation on, on social media about it. A lot. So we're going to go to break. We're going to come back, and we're going to talk about Colin Kaepernick and his uh, decision to sit out the national anthem on the Right Long Radio Show. All right, welcome back to Right Long Radio Show. So, um, I'm George Holt. That's Gil Contreras with the Perrier in his mouth, and his boo is French, so he's got to drink the Perrier. Right. And uh, <laughs> and this is Marshall McLean to my left, who does uh, has no such foreign exotic drink. He's tap got water. Uh, he's got tap water in a uh, a nice thermos bottle, and I've got it's not from Michigan. I've got some sort of off brand Seven Eleven tea that I put in my Carl Jr. cup from earlier because it still had ice in it. So. Wow, if you I put that really, cup on the table, it could be a product placement. It could be, right? I, I left my really nice uh, Arctic cup at home today. Um, so anyway, uh, so our big topic today, and we got something else after that, but our big topic is quarterback Colin Kaepernick of the San Francisco 49ers. I don't think it's a big topic. But. Well, it is a big topic because it, it it's engendered a lot of response and a lot of feelings from people, people all in their feelings behind it. Saying these ones. Yeah, you know, and they and they, wanna, they want to uh, – you know, and there's some good points on both sides of it. But uh, so what he did was he decided that he was not going to stand during the national anthem. And when they asked him why not, he basically had to be known that he was protesting because he wasn't going to stand. He's going to sit it out and not stand for the national anthem while the country was treating black people in such a negative way. Colin Kaepernick is himself African-American, which added another dimension to this. I'm waiting for somebody who's not African-American to take a stance like this for African Americans hasn't happened yet. It's always been African American athletes from Ali to the uh, Mexico City Three uh, to uh, there's Gill John, right with the John fist. Carlos. Yeah, well, John. Well, you, yeah, you exactly. Did have, you did have some some white. Well, they described them as as uh, hippies. I know this is you know wrong time period, but who chained themselves to the Oakland PD or actually Oakland Association building? No, no, I, no. I, I mean, I mean professional athletes. Oh, athletes. Okay. I mean professional athletes. Right. I'm waiting for. Uh, um, you know, pick somebody, uh, hey, are Tom there, Brady or somebody. To, are there you know. any uh, Mexican profession? Oh, I guess soccer. We play. And boxing? We play football. Boxing? Football. You guys you guys be knocking people out, too. Oh, man. that's right. That's yeah, right. man. There's a lot of Julio Cesar Chavez that's and right. Julio Cesar Chavez Sock Jr. people up. Knocking them out, man. That's right. So, you think Tiger Woods would take the same stance? At this point, what does he have to lose? Um, but uh, no, yeah, yeah, you know, you know what? Probably not. But I wouldn't have said Colin Kaepernick would have either, because Colin Kaepernick was an extremely bankable athlete a couple of years ago. Well, you have you heard the underlying story, and whether it's true or not, but there was an, another NFL athlete that that claims that he, meaning 
Kaepernick has become more um, radical, if you want to use that term, that he's become more radical since he started dating, get this, a Muslim girlfriend. Right. Dun, somebody, dun, somebody, dun, somebody, dun, somebody tried to say he converted to Islam, but that doesn't make any difference anyway. It doesn't. Uh, but listen, so let's do this. Let's, for people who don't have the background, let's run the video. And then we'll get back and, and we'll talk about it. And this is from a Bay Area source. So they're kind of like more 49er-ish, kind of, you know, making it a, put an extra focus on it. So let's check it out. First, the story that has everyone talking tonight, Colin Kaepernick, defending his decision to sit out the national anthem at Friday's preseason game. Our Maria Medina caught up with the defiant and determined 49ers quarterback at Levi Stadium today. Uh, I'll continue to sit. I'm going to continue to stand with the people that are being oppressed. 49er quarterback Colin Kaepernick is standing his ground about his choice to sit during the national anthem. This is because I'm seeing things happen to people that don't have a voice, people that don't have a platform to talk and have their voices heard and affect change. Kaepernick explained in the locker room after practice today, he made his decision based on what he believes are social injustices in our country right now. The example he gave, police brutality, claiming he's been racially profiled by police in the past. One of my roommates was moving out of a house in college and because we were the only black people in that neighborhood, the cops got called and all of us had guns drawn on us. You can become a cop in six months and don't have to have the same amount of training as a cosmetologist. That's, that's insane. I mean, someone that's holding a curling iron has more education and more training than people that have a gun and are going out on the street to protect us. The quarterback has actually sat during the national anthem at all the preseason games, but no one noticed until Saturday's game when he did it for the first time in uniform. He says many of his teammates support him. Everyone has the right to you know, stand up for what they believe in. So um, I respect that first and foremost, whether I agree with what he did or not and the way he did it. Kaepernick says he believes what he's doing is right, even if that means his decision has consequences on his career, including getting cut from the team. I can't look in the mirror and see other people dying on the street that should have the same opportunities that I've had. Kaepernick was actually asked to speak to his teammates about why he did what he did. He says they had an open conversation about it. Some of the players told us they understand his decision. At Levi Stadium, Maria Medina, KPIX 5. Well, reaction on social media has been All right. So, yes, reaction on social media has been swift. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I respect everybody's right. To protest, it is an American thing, and whether I agree with what you're saying or not, I'll always respect and defend your right to protest in a in a lawful manner. Okay, and even if it's sometimes if it's unlawful, civil disobedience is actually an effective tool sometimes. But when you go on to say stupid shit, like uh, it's easier to be a cosmetologist than it is to be a police officer. Um, mm. Mm. You know, yes, the police academy is six, I think it's seven months long now, but let's just go with six months. If you average it out, it probably is six months. First of all, anybody can show up at cosmetology school and uh, they'll let you in as long as you have a check, <laughs> okay? You write the check to uh, Marinello School of Beauty and you got a, you got a seat uh, someplace, right? And you get in there and, and, and uh, I guarantee you that there's no vetting process for you to show up for that. Whereas the police academy is not the case. They don't just let you walk in off the street and say, I'm a police cadet now. There's an extensive vetting process, and the vast majority of people who start that process do not make it. So if you take into account there's a lot of vetting before you even get to day one of the police academy, it's ridiculous to make the comparison to cosmetologists. And not to down cosmetologists. I once dated a cosmetologist. She's a lovely person, okay? You did. I'm sure there's very nice, cos very nice cosmetology people out there, okay? She was great. Um, but, she did hair. She did hair. Yeah, she did hair, man. Sure. She did hair and all that. She was a barber, too. She had her own barbershop. A couple Boom. of them, actually. So... Um, you know, that is uh, not a slam on cosmetologists. I'm just saying that's a silly comparison because the vetting's not there. Right. Now, let's start on day one of the cosmetology school versus day one of the police academy. Let's come back six months later and see how many empty seats there are because of people wa getting washed out, people quitting, uh, realizing, you know, this isn't for me. Uh, Cosmetology is well, tough. Right. Cosmet <laughs> well, he also, said, he also said education, too. Well, education. Let's talk about that. So education and training. Okay. I uh, think I think you have to have a master's degree to become a cosmetologist. Really? Do uh, you? Uh, yeah. Uh, is that is that for Clairol or for L'Oreal <laughs> or for all of them? So, and again, not slamming cosmetologists. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is this: 
you talk about a, a police academy being six months, that's not six months of four hour days, five five days a week. That's six months of of hard, long ass days, arduous, sometimes twelve hour days, sometimes six to seven day weeks, and um, with a lot of pressure being put on you and a not a lot of knowledge being shoved down your throat that you must regurgitate on a regular basis because they realize that we're playing for keeps and it's you studying in a lot of areas, uh, not just the law, but there's a lot of physical things that go into a lot of things having to do with uh, on, um, defensive tactics and uh, marksmanship and driving. A whole bunch of skills you, ha- you have to master. A whole lot of skill sets. So it's a hell of a six months, okay? You don't so, have the risk so, of possibly getting burned by a curling iron. A curling iron or getting like hair dye in your fingernails. We don't have that, right? So it's silly for him to say that. Uh, I do like how they said he was standing his ground, though. I caught that. That was that was uh, that was nice. But uh, my thing is this: I understand, and that's his right to protest. And I don't disagree with why he's protesting. You don't? I do not disagree with why he's protesting, because somebody, if he feels that way, let him protest. Because here's the thing: when people burn up Ferguson and they burn up St. Louis, people say, "Well, how come? How come people who are upset about that why don't they why don't they protest peacefully?" Remember that. Why are they up there burning stuff up? There's other ways to protest. You can protest peacefully. Well, he's protesting peacefully. And now people got a problem with that. Well, because his protest is bullshit. That's why. Well, you don't think it's that, a, you know, you have, where's, ha- where's the bullshit? We, ha- we have a right to, you have a right to protest. You have, you have a First sure. Amendment right. Okay, fine. You have a right to say, you know, whatever you want to say. Okay, cool. Um, but if, if what you're protesting is nonsense, then you're just a dipshit. Well, what's, and, what's and, nonsense, though? And so if... Um, He's a dipshit. The, the well, I don't disagree that he's a dipshit. I don't disagree with that. I'm asking you though, what's the what's the the nonsense of, that he's protesting about? If I hear, what's not legit? If I hear one more black person talk about how they're oppressed, and, 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 and I, I, I'm, I'm going to so stick, black people. To, okay. I'm going to stick needles in my eyes. Or right, have African Americans not historically been the group that suffered the most oppression in the history of this country? I, I, I'm just, yeah, I, I'm going to need more than that. I, well, I, answer I, the question: Yes or no? It ain't Look, hard to say yes or no, yes or no. If, if, African Americans historically suffered the most oppression in this country. If, any other group? No. Really? Right. Who, who's got African Americans beat on that? Who suffered uh, more oppression? American Indians. More oppression? Yeah. Tell me how. Uh, go, go to a reservation. You ever been to a reservation? We've been to the housing project. Sure. You ever been to a reservation? Been, you know what? I Actually, the last reservation I was on, so if you want to call it a reservation... I was uh, actually in, a, in an don't area on the way. Don't be wrong. Ah, <laughs> no, the casino, no, no, I wasn't going there. There's the another casino. one nearby, but I actually been on the property there, and I saw some very nice homes with people making a lot of money. Mm. But uh, I'm not saying that they didn't. Uh, they did suffer something that was much akin to genocide, Look, but it didn't go on as long. It didn't go on for as many years. It, well, it's still going on. Number one, and and two, so it's, it's, okay. Black people were slavery, clear. Slavery that happened 200 years ago. If this is your argument in 2016, no, I don't think he's talking about that. I don't think anybody's. I don't think anybody's sitting at the national anthem because of slavery anymore. Oh, uh, you better listen to. I, I think. On, I think we're uh, talking about. View. It started there, and, hey, and it continues called, hey, on to this radio. day. It continues on to this day. So black people are still catching hell. And here's my thing. They are? What, what hell did you catch today? Well, I'm Thank different. Thank you very much. I, what, what hell I'm did talking you, about, hold on a second, hold what, on a second. What, I'm talking, what, what hell well, I, you know what? I got, a, I got a friend who's an American Indian who's a millionaire. You want me to get him on the phone and ask him what oppression he said he faced today? I'm I'm different, man. I'm I'm in a different I'm in a different situation. (laughs) Okay, but you know why? What about our? I guarantee you, right now, I can. There's neighborhoods I can walk through. I can. Me and him can walk out of here right now. What about? And we can go south to Torrance or north to Beverly Hills, and we're going to get out and walk around the neighborhood and see how long it is before we suffer some oppression. Before somebody decides, let's go talk to those guys. They don't talk to nobody else. So it happens. You're, you're both going to go dress like this, and you're going to go drive to some city where you don't live. And so gonna, what? And you're going to park your car and just walk around. Yeah, and I, can do, and I can do that if I want to do that. And if it was you, why, why or if I was you? a white person, I might not get stopped. See, here's the thing, man. People people don't want black people. It seems like it seems like there's a certain subject or a certain segment of America that want black people to either develop amnesia or laryngitis. Either forget it happened or don't say nothing about it because it's happened. OK, and, it can, and we continue to see the bullshit that goes on to this day. And here's my thing. People who are mad at Colin Kaepernick, who are saying, oh, that's bullshit. He shouldn't do it. And that's your right to say that. But why were you not so pissed off when Michael Slager murdered Walter Scott on video in a, while in police uniform? That's the kind of shit he's protesting. That happens. It still happens. We saw it happen. It's on video. So he's protesting that. But people are more upset about him protesting than the shit he's talk- that he's protesting about. So where were all these people who were mad at Colin Kaepernick when that police officer in full uniform on duty 
murdered somebody, gunned him down. I didn't see them protesting against Michael Slaker. I didn't I didn't see people saying anything about that. And where, where was Colin when over 3,000 people were killed in the city of Chicago last year? Where, where was he? Where was his protest? Where was he going to Chicago and meeting with Rahm Emanuel? Is he or? telling somebody they can't protest about that? Where is the protest? That's I'm my at, He's That's doing my a protest. Point. He's doing a protest, but I'm asking, I'm saying... He's not telling people they can't protest about there, that. There people is, are telling him he can't protest about this. There is oppression, and but it's in the black community committed by blacks, for God's sake. So that's it's the only. Not that's the, the damn the, that's the only. Well, we have, I just we, gave you an example. We have covered this. I just gave you an example. We have covered this extensively since we started this. And show. I just gave you an example. And we agree that these incidents that you guys pull out are outliers. Yes, they are. There are millions yes, of police are. officers who make thousands of arrests on a daily Every basis, day. and they no put problem. people in jail, and nobody Absolutely. gets killed, and they're all racist. Absolutely. No. Sakes. Here's my thing. Police officers are not ever supposed to do what Michael Slager did. Nobody expects a police officer to murder somebody in cold blood. We expect gangsters to shoot it out and kill people. We do? We expect that. I'm not saying we have to accept it or tolerate it, but we accept. We expect that. Because they're gangsters. They do gangster shit. That's why we call them gangsters. Wow. But a police officer to murder somebody in cold blood like that is something that's shocking. And I expected more outrage from the same people who were outraged by Colin Kaepernick refusing to stand. I expected to see more outrage. Well, I shouldn't have expected it. And I ain't going to lie. I didn't expect the, it. The, the but guy, I'm wondering where it arrested. was. He, he got prosecuted. Sure. For God's sake. Who, right. Okay. Right. Where's the protest? He's well, a criminal. Because like we still under- should be. Po- I didn't even see anybody posting about it. Really. I saw some people being real quiet about it. People who usually defend the police, nobody defended him. I'll give them that. Social media, I didn't see any of my friends who usually defend the police on everything. None of them defended that officer on that. And the good on There was you. nothing to defend. Right. But there's still some shit that people are trying to stretch it and say, okay. But they didn't that time. To their credit, nobody tried to defend it. But I also didn't see those same people coming out castigating that officer the same way they're castigating Colin Kaepernick for protesting that sort of thing. It ain't like everything ain't free and clear. We're not we're not we're not done here yet. We're not we're we're not in this post racial era that everybody thought was going to happen in January two thousand nine. Uh, we ain't, right, we ain't nobody, there yet. Nobody thought that. A lot of people thought right, that. A lot thought. of people thought that. A lot of people said, "Are we in a post racial America now?" I have you a didn't question. see. I seen magazine covers with that on it. I have a Please. question. Yes, is sir. It, is it possible that he's doing this as a publicity stunt? Oh, just, just because his his career is questionable. I think not only is it a publicity. I don't think it's a publicity publicity stunt. I think he's at the point where he's got nothing to lose. I'm going to be up out of here anyway. Let me get this off my chest. I've been feeling this way for a while. Now, that's like like Caitlyn Jenner now coming out and saying, well, I always felt like a girl. Now I'm going to be one. Well, it would have been more heroic to me had you done that when you was on the Weedy Box, right? (laughs) For you to wait now when nobody gives a shit and you don't don't stand to lose anything. So for Colin Kaepernick, when you were going to the Super Bowl, you should have sat your ass down then. Well... You should have sat your ass down wait, then, wait, and wait, then I would have wait, a lot more respect wait, for the wait, protest, wait, wait, although wait, I still do wait, respect wait. his right to protest. Didn't Caitlyn actually technically lose something? Oh, oh, wow. oh my oh, God. Sorry. Oh, my okay. God. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not yet, I don't think. I don't think yet. It's coming, though. Nope. It's, it's going to happen. <laughs> no pun intended. No pun intended. So, so what I'm saying is, yes, I agree that this dude didn't do this Two years ago when he was a viable NFL superstar. Well, here, and he could have. Here, here's my two cents. And, and so we were, we, some, of, some guys were talking about this. And, hey, 323-293-3375. And, and you have people trying to compare <clears throat> what, what Kaepernick is doing now to Muhammad Ali right. or Jim Brown. Those guys all had something to lose, though. John Carlos. They, they, not not, only, right. did, not, not right. only did they have something to lose, but they did more than sit down. Right. Okay. They did right. more than sit down. They did more than wear some ugly socks with little pigs on them. I saw that too. In oh, did he do that? Yeah, yeah, he did that at practice. He had a little 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 pig uh, oh, socks okay. on with a little police hat on. Okay. Um, that to me was funnier than him sitting down because sitting down for for the national anthem is is a whole. It, it, I mean, it's clear pig socks. You're talking about police, right? Sure. You could one, be talking about anything. You could be talking about slavery or whatever. If you're sitting right, right. out for the national or, anthem, or, sure. Or people bringing the military into it as well. So because they're talking about the San Diego game that's coming up, where they're actually honoring veterans. The military, is yes. Because he he's so, going to be there, yeah. But 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 going back to Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Not only did they do more than than sit down or change their name or do anything like that, they did so much more than that, and they're still doing it. So well, not so, Muhammad Ali, but yeah, go ahead. Well, with it because he, 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 he was, he was, because he was up until his rest death. Rest in power. And yeah. Up, yeah, he was. Yeah, and, but up until his death, he was still active. Sure. Okay. Even even that he lost the power of speech, he was still a symbol of that. 
Yes, he was. He, okay. just, as, a, as a living symbol. And still a symbol. So my point is, I don't, I don't take issue with what he's doing if his plan is to actually do something more than sit down and give a give a speech about he's bothered by this. Oh, I think that I think that might be it. Uh, but now now that he's not going to be playing football anymore, maybe he'll do right. more. Right. Well, just like the ESPYs. Okay, you got to do more than just stand up and say enough's enough. Right. You should you should take it to the next level. But that's better than doing nothing. We actually have a caller. Hey, caller, what's your name and where you calling from? Yeah, what's up, guys? It's Dwight Kirkpatrick. And DK, what's going on, man? Oh, man, I'm over here listening to the uh, topic of the evening. And uh, first time I ever yelled at my damn computer screen, it's <laughs> <yelled. laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. I get mean, get some pins to put in his call. eyes. Well, 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 for Gil, you know, for you to say or even bring up, like, the black oppression and, you know, compare it to what Native Americans been through, that's not actually fair because it's two totally different things. Yeah, the Native Americans were here, but they got pretty much swindled out of what they had, but we got taken from a whole other land and brought over and force-fed all kinds of, you know, gibberish, mumble-jumble. Well, well you, 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 you didn't. 200 years ago that occurred. But well, you, but still, you it's still yeah, there, I mean, though. You're right, you're right. Of course, I didn't, but at the same time, I'm not going around saying, like, you know, uh, because I am black and, you know, we're oppressed like that. But for you to even bring it up, damn, I'm like... But, there, but there, it's still, it's right still reverberations of that to this day. I don't, I don't know no yeah, Africans yeah, named... Yeah, I, yeah, hey, there, there's, DK, I don't know no Africans named Kirkpatrick. Okay? <laughs> so there's still reverberations of that to this wow. day. Okay? <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, it ain't over. I don't know an African's name McLean. I don't know an African's name Hope. Okay? Hey, hey, yeah. That's an African name. Yeah. Is, it, is it McLean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we owned Irish people, man. Oh, okay. That's the other way around. So what I'm saying is, is Dwight, is that there's still vestiges of slavery that are with yeah. us. Okay? And even though it was, and, and Gil says 200 years ago, I like the math on that. Slavery wasn't even abolished until the 1860s, and that wouldn't do 200 years ago. But okay. Uh, and then Jim Crow beyond that was in hell. In our lifetime, we still had that going on, right? Well, is yeah, is Gil from like Texas? Said, there's still vestiges of mm-hmm. all of that going on. I mean, hell, you know, I'm, hell, I'm, I'm profiled to this day just driving in town, just like I'm sure, you, hell, you told there were stories about you being profiled and yeah, man. all that other stuff. But um, never happened to me. I'm not going around crying. You have the right complexion for the connection what? and the protection. I don't know. I'm dark as you, brother. What you talking not about? Not quite. What? Almost. Not what quite. About, but see, you had the hair, though. They thought you had blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, uh, back to what I was saying, you, you like really threw me off this evening, dude. I mean, I, I don't know if you're if this is like a little act or whatever. But <laughs> damn, dude, you can't, you can't I, I, really think uh, that. Though. Hey, do I, I got some bad news for you, brother. This ain't no whack. This oh. is it. This is the real deal. If, if, oh. we, if we were to have Code yeah, 7 yeah. together, we'd have the same conversation. You'd hear the same monologue. <laughs> and, and when he and I do have meals together, it's the same conversation, <laughs> believe me. This is no act, as Muhammad oh, no. Ali once famously oh, said. Dude. This is no act. Mm-mm. No, Lord oh, well, Jesus. Like what I tell you at the top of the hour, man. Be buying, man because, dude, no, it's a, it's, it's, this is no act, man. This is the butt naked truth right on the horse named credibility. Hey, Dwight, look here. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to quote scripture for you. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. Uh-oh. Jesus oh. said, don't lighten up, tighten up. Okay? That was, uh, was that Jesus or Jesus? I think that was Jesus. That was Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> don't lighten right, up, guys, tighten up. Hey, appreciate the call, Dwight. Appreciate the continued support, man. All right. <laughs> so, so you know, uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, yeah. Slavery. Let me, let, let me ask go, you. Go ahead. Let, let, you wrote something down when yeah, I said Jim Crow. I, go I ahead. Did. Because if if you're talking about your memories and one us wanting or people wanting you to have amnesia and laryngitis, if if, if slavery uh, is your thing and just some legacy of slavery, your thing. Uh, yes. Yeah, you know, if like yeah. this, this I'm just into it. I'm a buff. I'm a slavery yeah. buff. Yeah, this, this, this yeah. is the you know, especially over the last seven and a half years, this, this is the new thing now. This uh, legacy because <laughs> nobody talked about slavery before Obama was elected. No. They, they didn't make roots or no, gone with the I, wind or none I of never, that. Before I never that. heard the term legacy of slavery. I Did, never heard that. Really? Yeah, I never heard that until uh, until I started listening to 
black hate talk radio. Well, that's probably because that's what, well, there was no such thing as black talk. You call it black hate talk. Well, there was no such thing as black talk radio probably before that, was it? I didn't have Sirius XM. Or you didn't, oh, that's what it was. You didn't have Sirius was, XM, that's it all. It was there, I just didn't you, have You just Sirius. came up. You could afford I, it now, that's all. <laughs> to do the economic, due to Obama's economic policies, oh, yeah, you right. and I had enough money where you could afford Sirius, and here you go. Okay. Yeah, actually, that's not true, but, uh, <laughs> but, but here, here's, here's my question. If, in fact, this, whatever happened 200 years ago, is affecting you now, which I, it's not affecting you, it's affecting poor people, but, but you're all kind of jumping into it. If that's true, then uh, slavery, Jim Crow, the founding of the KKK, we're all part of the Democratic Party. So the, your beef, if your beef is 200 years old, your beef is with the very party where the majority of black people actually vote for. And over the last at least 50 years that, that, that I, okay, I'll say 40, 40 okay. years that I've been an adult, a, over 18 or over. Mm -hmm. For those 40 years, the, the cities that follow the, these progressive Democrat policies, uh, this public policy is what keeps poor people poor, keeps them dependent on the very government that we talked about that wastes money on silly ideas that produce no results. And there, black people in the inner city is Chicago, Detroit, South L.A. They're not doing any better. Now, and, where's, and, where's the government's part in that? So the public policy that keeps them dependent on the government. In terms of like welfare reform and that kind of stuff or, or lack of welfare reform? So. So if your if your beef it really is about slavery, it, it, then your your beef is really with the Democratic Here Party, it isn't so, it? So so you black folks have nothing to lose, and you should vote for Donald Trump. Isn't that what he said? What do you got to lose? You have nothing. Well, you you maybe you guys do, but poor people in these inner city areas with those three. So jump from the fire, in, jump from the frying pan right into the fire. In cities where you have uh, fifty years and, and you've got nothing. 50 years, then poor black people, poor Hispanic people, poor people in general white people. have received nothing. Well, as, as once was nothing. famously said, the poor will always be with us. I forget who said that. Was that Plato or Aristotle or somebody like that? You're always going to have that element. In terms of public policy, uh, I, this is one of the areas in which I'm conservative. I think we need to have a sweeping overhaul of our welfare system. And we've done, we've done... We've done uh, we've done that before, uh, probably in the early '90s. I think there was a time limit put on welfare. Before there wasn't, we had generations. Well, it was Clinton. It was, it was it was Bill Clinton who was the first fantastic. one to come with push through uh, uh, the first ever welfare reform. And and that was something that was beneficial. And I would like to see that continue because I really do think it creates a culture of dependency. Should we build a wall? Uh, yes, in South and I'm with that South too. I, okay, so let's talk about that since you but, brought but, that up. Because it, but, it came but, up last week, too, about this wall. But somebody asked, answer my question. Okay. If your beef is about slavery and Jim Crow and KKK and all that nonsense, if that's true, why do you support the very – why are you not angry with the very political party that put all this in place? That okay, hold on now, hold on now. So the Democrats invented slavery in America? The, they, they invented the Jim Crow laws that – KK, well, that, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on that. KK, Thank you, Fact Frida. KK, so let's talk about that. Was founded by so the Democratic we, Party, and, and you know, is so you 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 know that I know, but maybe you think people out there don't know that we've seen a switching of ideological poles and political poles in the last 50 years between the Democrats and Democrats and Republicans. Yep. So really, this is about liberals and conservatives more than anything. And I know that every step of the way, every step of social progress, it has been conservatives who've stood in the way of that not liberals. So we can call them Democrats, Republicans, Whigs, know-nothings, Tories, however you want to go back in the name of political parties in this country. It really comes down to conservatism and liberalism. And uh, in terms of people like to say, well, MLK was a Republican. They could throw that one out there. How come black people aren't Republicans? MLK was a Republican. Republicans didn't care that MLK was a Republican when they tried to block him getting his holiday. Governor Meacham of Arizona, Republican, Senator John McCain, yes, that John McCain of Arizona, fought tooth and nail against MLK Day being recognized in Arizona. They didn't give a shit that he was a Republican. Why should I give a shit that he was a Republican? And this is recently now. Mm -hmm. This is in the since the late 90s. Mm -hmm. Okay? So so we know that Full they circle. switch sides. Full circle. Why, why, does, why did Arizona change that? Why did they change it? Wasn't it to get Super Bowl? Oh, was that what it was? NFL? That's possible, right? Because they didn't have the Cardinals before wow, that. Wow, full circle. That's possible. I didn't know about that. But that's possible. It makes sense if you look at the timeline when Could the Cardinals went there. because there's so many African Americans in the NFL? Well, there's a lot now. <laughs> a lot of, uh, yeah, in the NFL for sure. And there's, there's a lot in the Phoenix area now, too, mm. compared to when it used to be. So, so when we talk about your beef with the Democratic Party. Well, that's not my beef. No. I, I, it should I, be your beef. That's what I mean. 
That's what I mean to say when you talk about your beef. I say when you talk about your beef, meaning you're talking about me. I'm sorry. I'm mixing Well, not you person, because you, you, you guys don't fall into this. I, you, you know you, what? Listen. You guys, listen. you're not being oppressed, please. Listen. You're not be, listen. When was the last time you were oppressed, Marshall? Listen. Maybe, I, maybe I'm I, not saying. Look, maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. I'm it's, not saying that possible. I don't have opportunities. It's possible. I'm not but saying. But it's not likely. Wait, I, wait, oh, wait, you asked me a question. I'm going to tell no, you. No, I'm trying to ask Marshall. Okay, because you asked me, but you know my answer, so jump over to yeah, Marshall. I, I know you're not oppressed that when you drive in in that Mercedes every day. Well, I, I don't want to Well, it's not the same one every day. Sometimes I drive another one. <laughs> I don't want to go down that road, but there is a bill on the governor's desk right now about equal work for equal pay. It's the second part of it. Really? Yeah. Isn't that something? The, the first part was about gender that passed last year. Which, yes. W- which helped us get the contract we got to bring our pay up to parity. Yes. The second part is specifically dealing with gen- – what, 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 the first part was gender. Now it's dealing with race. So you can't really? pay you can't pay people differently because of race. Somebody's doing that in this day and age in 2016. Are you I, kidding me? More I, useless government. I whoa, guess whoa, so. Whoa, 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 whoa! Was that a bad law, Gil? Since there's a bill, Gil. Is that a bad law? It, it, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that you have to pay people the same regardless of their race. Is that no, ridiculous? It, it's ridiculous that we have to talk. How, it is ridiculous that we got to have that conversation. I totally agree with you. Into in 2016, we got to talk about that. What race is being paid less? I don't know. This is my first time hearing about this. I don't this. know either. That's what I'm saying. It's but ridiculous. okay, hold on. If that is the case, should we fix it? <laughs> yes or no? If that is going on, should we fix it? You know what? That's it. Poetis. Yes or no? Shut us down, Poet. Damn. That, that's it. That's you can't it. say yes or no to that. You know, it's if it turns, you're, if you're asking if, silly questions. How is that a silly you're question? Asking silly, I didn't ask you if Superman and, walked in here. What, what question would you ask him? That's a silly question. It's and, I, and, I, and I, or a tug on his cape. Yeah. I asked you if people are being paid differently because of their race. Should we not address that? Yes or no? Yeah, spit in the wind. Mm. Pull on the skate. Well, should we address it? Damn, it's like pulling teeth at this bitch. Can't, should we address that? It's ridiculous. So no, that, it's a silly it, question. God damn. Hey, 323 393 Jeff Brown, where are you? No, that, that's All it. right. We're shutting down. So that, listen. That's it. That's a wrap. That, Good night, folks. I'm, be, I'm George Holt. Turn the lights off. This is Gil Contreras. Contreras. That's it. This is Marshall McLean. Look, you can follow us Great. on our social media here. Don't follow me. Ride Along Radio Show on Instagram, Twitter, Ride Along Radio. Only Send us you'll an email. get followed. He won't get followed. And, li- and light his ass up on those YouTube comments, too. Ah. Please. Jesus uh, Christ. Know, I'm going to go home and stick needles in my eyes. Do them right here, live. Ah, yeah, yeah for ratings. We have a fundraiser. That's what I'm going to do. A telethon. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'll bring the needles. Somebody mm. donate some needles. <laughs> Later. <laughs>